All right, well, without further ado then, um, Daniel Stone holds a BA and MA degree in history from the University of Florida and Florida Atlantic University. He is now a PhD candidate at Manchester, Manchester Metropolitan University is that right? mm -hmm. in American Religious History. Uh, he's taught classes at Broward College, Schoolcraft College, University of Detroit Mercy, and Wayne County Community College. He currently is a researcher at a private library archive in Detroit, where he and his wife Laura and daughter Lily live. He is also a deacon in the Church of Jesus Christ, established by William Pickerton. And we appreciate him being here. Glad to be to town and we yeah, can nice. work this out. And um, I turn the time over to you and say, <laughs> I great time. afterwards we will have some refreshments um, that will be out in the hallway. And other than that, we'll do some <coughs> questions and answers afterwards. So save the tough questions for the end here. Okay. Let's put them, put them to work. All right. Thanks, Take Chris. It. Appreciate it. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. I really appreciate it. So I wrote the new biography by Signature Books on William Bickerton, Forgotten Latter-day Prophet. And you might ask, why on earth would I write about William Bickerton? <laughs> well, he is the founder of the third largest Latter-day Saint church in the world. So the fact that there has not really been anything written about him, and you have all these other writings about James Jesse Strang, you know, Granville Hedrick, Alpheus Cutler, all these other smaller movements of the Latter-day Saint movement, and nothing's been written about William Bickerton. That was really striking, and also the fact that William Bickerton, out of all the major claimants, as Steve Shields always brings out, uh, that he was one of the major claimants that had no direct connection to Joseph Smith, right? He he didn't know Joseph Smith. Uh, Joseph Smith died before William Bickerton even joined the Latter-day Saint movement, and he was not a member of the original church when Joseph Smith was alive. So how on earth does he even claim to have to be the successor of Joseph Smith? It's a really interesting story. Um, I am a Bickertonite. I grew up in the church, so that's kind of how I got interested in it. I was interested in American religious history growing up, and when I started reading the church's uh, official history books, I kept realizing that there was so little written about William Bickerton, and then I heard how we were colloquially called Bickertonites in the larger Latter-day Saint movement, and I'm going, well, wait a minute, how come William Bickerton isn't talked about, but we're called Bickertonites, and all the, basically it seems like the church was kind of brought forth by him, it, a lot of the theology was kind of, I would assume was brought by him, and there's nothing really written about him, um, and that's what really piqued my interest. And I got into the church archive, which oftentimes does not happen, because, but since I was a member, I was able to get access. And I was also able to get a lot of documents for the first time from an archive in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where the, it's a private archive, and the person is uh, very, um, he's very careful about who to give it to. So I was so thankful he told me I was the first one to get access to it. So I had thousands of pages of documents that people had not seen before. So it was really exciting and exhilarating and at the same time extremely humbling and scary because I basically didn't have anybody else to base my interpretations off of. There was one gentleman named Gary Enns, he got his PhD at the University of Utah <coughs> that wrote a dissertation on he, on uh, kind of communal experiments in Kansas and he mentions quite a bit and talks about the Bickertonites in Kansas and he published two articles about it. but. That was it. That's the most scholarly thing that was out there. So I, I got my master's degree and said, you know what, I'm going to see if I can tackle William Bickerton. So that's how I got into it. And we all know the story about Joseph Smith being murdered at Carthage, so I don't need to go into that. But where does William Bickerton fit within the Latter-day Saint tradition? I think that's what makes the story so fascinating. So William Bickerton was an, an English immigrant, and he was a coal miner. He immigrates to America in 1831. He lands in New York City. He eventually makes his way to Wheeling, Virginia, which now is West Virginia at the time. And or now it's West Virginia now, but at the time it was Virginia. And he's a coal miner. And he's just trying to make ends meet. Um, he eventually gets married, has a, a son in around 1844. And he hear, he's looking for a better life. And he sees the prospects of Pittsburgh, which is not too far from Wheeling. And during this time, Pittsburgh was considered the Birmingham of America the smoke and the soot in the sky basically advertised the city's success, but it also was very smoggy and very uh, uh, melancholy, me melancholy and a lot, gave a lot of melancholy with, with the, uh, the image of it. But in the end, you see that it really advertised the city's success. He moves there with the hopes of gaining prospects, and he eventually settles in a borough called West Elizabeth, which is about 15 miles away from Pittsburgh, 
It's a borough along the Monongahela River, so it's connected to Pittsburgh, and it's a great and it's a really big mining area. It's actually eventually it becomes the, one of the greatest mining areas in, in Pennsylvania and in America. So as he's in Pittsburgh, how on earth does he get introduced int uh, introduced to the Latter Day Saint movement? That's what's fascinating is because when Joseph Smith was murdered, where was Sidney Rigdon at the time? He was in Pittsburgh because he was the vice presidential running mate uh, with Joseph Smith for the ticket for the presidency. And although it's not law, it looks really good politically to have uh, candidates on the same ticket from different states. Sidney Rigdon was originally from Western Pennsylvania, so he goes there for two reasons, to basically fulfill Joseph Smith's prophecy that sooner or later my servant Sidney will go to Pittsburgh, and also to basically go there to establish residency for the vice presidential ticket. He hears about Joseph Smith being murdered, he races back to Nauvoo, he loses in the climactic debate between Brigham Young and Sidney Rigdon, he loses, and then eventually he retreats back to Pittsburgh. As all this is going on, William Bickerton around this time is moving to Pennsylvania, and the Pittsburgh newspapers are exploding with information, not only about Joseph Smith's death, but about Sidney Rigdon, because he's kind of like this interesting guy that is supposed to lead the Latter-day Saint movement. One Pittsburgh newspaper actually said, we know he'll become the master patriarch when he goes back to Illinois, but that's not what happens. And they actually have to issue a correction in the newspaper saying, oops, um, he's not the master patriarch, he's lost, and now we're stuck with him. They weren't really too happy about it, and the Pittsburgh press is going wild about this. And, Willie, and this is what's so interesting about Sidney Rigdon, and this is why we start the story with him, is because he was just vehemently opposed to the Twelve. Because Sidney Rigdon and Joseph Smith kind of were having a rough uh, patch of, of, of their friendship. But they kind of patch it up when he moves to Pittsburgh. But the reason they were having a rough spot, one of the main reasons is because Joseph Smith proposed to Sidney Rigdon's daughter, Nancy. And this is the first time Sidney Rigdon actually hears about polygamy, according to his son, John Rigdon. And you could see that they were kind of on the outskirts because, you know, Sidney Rigdon was always so close to Joseph Smith, right? But he doesn't know about polygamy, so you can kind of see the this, this strain in the relationship. And he confronts Joseph Smith and basically says, what are you doing? And he, in his mind, he, according to John Wycliffe Rigdon, he says that Joseph Smith basically repented, told Sidney Rigdon, well, I'm not going to do it anymore. And the pact was, okay, if you're not going to do it anymore, then I won't say anything. We'll just kind of keep push it under the table and push it under the rug. Well, when he gets excommunicated by the Twelve, he's getting on a steamboat to head back to Pittsburgh. He's fuming. And Orson Hyde tells uh, Sidney Rigdon something. He says, be careful how you put pen to paper in this time of your excitement. Wait a few months and then see how you feel. And Sidney Rigdon does not take that advice. He goes back to Pittsburgh, tries to basically create, to restore the restoration in a sense, and he creates his own church called the Church of Christ. And he actually organizes the church on the 15th anniversary of the original Church of Christ by Joseph Smith in April of 1845. And what's interesting to kind of give you an idea of the newspaper articles and what's going on, he, they're actually, it's the second to the last day of the conference, and they're conducting the conference in the middle of Pittsburgh. And all of a sudden, they hear shrieks and cries outside the windows. And they're trying to figure out what's going on. Well, they realize it's, it's this, the city of Pittsburgh is literally on fire, and it's burning to the ground. Nowadays, it's called the Great Conflagration of 1845. So what Sidney Rigdon does is they get down on their, everybody in the congregation gets down on their knees, they pray, and they basically say that, according to their church minutes, that they saw, had visions of angels flying out from the congregation outside the windows to put out the fire in Pittsburgh. And they basically said, you know, thanks to our prayer, the city was spared and saved. And the secular press heard word of this and really did not like that idea of Sidney Rigdon. So this is, this is what William Bickerton and others in Pittsburgh would have been reading. It says, when the story of Rigdon saving the city reached the secular press, people were repulsed. These fanatics quietly pursued their mummeries while the city was consuming the Pittsburgh Daily Gazette and advertiser Huff. Our citizens would have thanked them to have sent their escort of heavenly messengers a little sooner and not have waited until the fairest part of our city was laid in ashes and many lives had fallen a sacrifice to the devouring elements. Rigdon's newspaper contained other strange things, the writer claimed, and promoted as many absurdities in this enlightened age as ever took place in the darkest eras. So it kind of goes to show why William Bickerton might have been interested in hearing about Sidney Rigdon, probably just out of curiosity. I mean, back then, going to hear a preacher or somebody speak, even if you didn't agree with them, was totally normal. 
So he, William Bickerton hears that, uh, that Sidney Rigdon is going to be preaching in Limetown, Pennsylvania, which I believe is now Coal Bluffs, Pennsylvania. And William Bickerton goes there to hear Sidney Rigdon preach. And as we understand from the Latter-day Saint tradition and from all the history books, we know that Sidney Rigdon was a great orator. And William Bickerton actually confirms this in his writings. He said that Sidney Rigdon was the best orator he had ever heard in classing the scriptures together. And he said after one sermon, he was convinced of the restoration. And it makes you wonder, why would William Bickerton join the Restoration Movement under Sidney Rigdon? Well, he was a Methodist, and he said that he had never been taught such a gospel. Even though Methodism in the, early, in the, in the 18th century believed in charismatic spiritual gifts like dreams and visions, by the 1820s, they kind of become a vested organization. They're not really uh, advertising those type of charismatic gifts. And Sidney Rigdon, this is exactly what he's promoting. Not only does he want to be an egalitarian prophet like Joseph Smith was early on in the Restoration, but he wants other members to have not only dreams and visions, but tongues, interpretation of tongues, all the gifts. And William Bickerton, as a poor English immigrant with really little education, this really interests him. And he becomes, he not only gets ordained into the Church of Christ as an elder, he be eventually becomes a 70. And Sidney Rigdon actually creates what is very similar to the, grant, to the Council of 50. He creates his own version called the Grand Council. So Joseph Smith had 50 members. Uh, Sidney Rigdon had 70 members. And he's ordaining prophets, priests, and kings in preparation for the, coming second, uh, for the second coming of Jesus Christ and for the millennium. And William Bickerton becomes a prophet, priest, and king in the Grand Council. As an interesting side note, William McClellan actually was a part of the Grand Council and eventually leaves uh, Sidney Rigdon's church, he was one of the original apostles of the, of, the, of the Mormon church, and William Bickerton actually replaces William McClellan in that grand council. So you see, Sidney Rigdon, in a sense, is trying to restore the restoration. He's trying to kind of bring it back to a more Kirtland era style. He names the, his church newspaper there, the Messenger and Advocate, after the Ohio newspaper of Kirtland. But he's also introducing things from Nauvoo, like the grand council. Now, the problem with egalitarianism and the idea of prophetic gifts, it's really nice to have it, and Joseph Smith saw the th same thing. If everybody's having charismatic gifts, it really brings people to the movement, especially in the 19th century. But it can also backfire, because what if the people within your congregation are having revelations that don't agree with the ones that you're having? And that's exactly what happened with Sidney Rigdon. Sidney Rigdon instituted the School of the Prophets in his church, and William Bickerton was a member of the School of the Prophets. And in the School of the Prophets, they were starting to have revelations that Sidney Rigdon was going astray. Because Sidney Rigdon was trying to build a humanitarian society in the Cumberland Valley of Pennsylvania. And that's where he wanted to build the New Jerusalem. He sees himself as the new leader that's supposed to gather Israel. He's supposed to finish what Joseph Smith was supposed to do. And it's hard because the School of the Prophets is saying, I don't know if this is such a good idea. And what's interesting, on the very last conference that's held in Pittsburgh, Sidney Rigdon is lambasting not only the LDS, not the ones that are in Nauvoo, but the ones that how they're planning to move to Utah. He's saying those, the Brighamites and the, the Quorum of Twelve are trying to stop the building of Zion, and I'm trying to do it. And he's also lambasting the people in his own church because he's hearing rumors of them saying, hey, these people are trying to stop what I'm trying to do. And William Bickerton is actually a member of the Grand Council. He's there at the conference, and he's listening to this. And the messenger and advocate actually interviewed some of the people in that conference, and they interviewed William Bickerton, and they asked him. And I'll paraphrase, but basically William Bickerton says to the newspaper, or to the members of the church, he says, yeah, I feel that I've been called by the Holy Spirit, and I feel my calling is from God. It's a very politically nice statement, because he knows that they're having revelations that Sidney Rigdon's going astray. There's a couple hundred people that eventually moved to the Cumberland Valley after this conference, and William Bickerton is not one of them. He kind of had this wait-and-see approach. Well, what ends up happening to this, what happens to the Cumberland Valley and this communitarian society eventually crumbles crumb away. They go bankrupt very quickly, and in this last fateful attempt to basically save their communitarian society, knowing full well they're going bankrupt, just like the Millerites, it's so fascinating, the Rigdonites basically clothe themselves in ascension robes, they go behind the barn, which had become their temple, and they fervently pray all night in the middle of February for the Savior's return. And to their dismay, Jesus never shows up. So shivering from the cold, they basically are bankrupt. They wallow back in despair. Sidney Rigdon eventually abandons his congregation, and he very says nicely, he says, well, he tells people, uh, you know, if anyone asks to know where I'm gone, tell them I've gone to hell on a thousand years mission. And he, and he goes and he escapes to uh, Friendship, New York. 
and that's where he basically is staying with his daughter and son-in-law. And his son-in-law even told Sidney Rigdon, saying, listen, if you're going to stay with us, you need to shut your mouth about religion. There's no more of this. So this is where, so you can read a lot of this story in uh, Van Wagner's biography of Sidney Rigdon. It's excellent. And, with, and really look at the, the newspapers of the Messenger and Advocate with Sidney Rigdon. It tells an amazing story. But where does William Bickerton fit within this? William Bickerton talks about that after Sidney Rigdon's church falters and goes away, he's in West Elizabeth. Some of the people that were members of the Cumberland Valley experiment basically are bankrupt, and they coalesce around Bickerton because they saw him as one of the main leaders. And he has this small cohort of followers that are around him. He's a poor coal miner. He's trying to sustain not only his growing family, but also he's, he's not even an American citizen, but he's also trying to financially and emotionally care for some of these bankrupt converts that had gone to the Cumberland Valley and are now are bankrupt and just looking for somebody to follow. It's really interesting that Sidney Rigdon didn't turn back to Methodism. He really believed in the Book of Mormon. So here's the problem. Sidney Rigdon in the, church, in the church newspaper is lambasting Brigham Young, has been saying all throughout the time of the Church of Christ, saying, Joseph Smith started polygamy, the Twelve are practicing it, and this is evil, we need to stop it. And William Bickerton is trying to figure out, okay, well, Sidney Rigdon faltered, so where does Brigham Young fit within all this? And he says to himself, you know what? Maybe, maybe Sidney Rigdon was wrong. Maybe Brigham Young is, the, is supposed to be leading. He's curious because what's happening with Brigham Young? He's moved out to Utah. They're prospering. The Mormon Battalion were some of the ones that found the first flakes of gold in California that eventually starts the gold rush. So they're trying. he's thinking maybe, maybe there's something to this. So he sends a letter to Canesville, which is the Iowa section of Winter Quarters, asking for information about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Two uh, LDS elders, John Murray and David James Ross, eventually meet with William Bickerton and his, con his cohort of nine members in West Elizabeth, and they know that he was uh, basically taught under Sidney Rigdon, and they share their concerns and questions. There's a lot of similarities. They basically believe in the same scriptures, but William Bickerton has this one question for the missionaries. Are you practicing polygamy? Because this is what Sidney Rigdon's saying, and the missionaries say, no, we're not because of the persecution and everything that the LDS church was facing, that was the public statement. So William Bickerton says, okay, I guess, I guess Sidney Rigdon was wrong. He joins the Latter-day Saint church. They actually create the West Elizabeth branch, and they immediately uh, ordain William Bickerton as the presiding elder. They rebaptize him, and now he has nine members of a West Elizabeth branch. And after 10 months, William Bickerton actually helps triple his congregation to 27 members. So you see he was really devout Mormon, really believed. If you read the Bickertonite minutes, you actually see that they're sustaining Brigham Young and the Twelve and their offices. So they really believed. And this is what makes another reason that makes William Bickerton so interesting. Is oftentimes we read in the history books that uh, Brigham Young makes the August 1852 announcement of the conference, right? That we are practicing polygamy. It's time to go public with it. And we often hear that that's where the big announcement happened. But according to the Bickertonite minutes, you, they actually heard about this announcement all the way earlier in March of, of 1852. Because there were people that were traveling east to kind of let the congregations know, hey, there's this announcement coming out, we're just trying to prep people for it. And they basically tell uh, a church uh, elders meeting in Allegheny, in Allegheny City, which is now the north side of Pittsburgh, William Bickerton goes there, and these, these LDS uh, emissaries say, listen, there's an announcement coming out about polygamy. If you accept it, you're going to receive God's approval. But if you don't, you'll receive damnation. And William Bickerton shocked because he thought they weren't practicing polygamy. And he stands up in the middle of the congregation and actually says, well, if the approval of God were to come to me by accepting the doctrine of polygamy, I would prefer the displeasure of God. And he storms out. And that's his, his end of affiliation with Brigham Young. So why on earth would William Bickerton still stay within the Restoration Movement? He really believed, again, in the Book of Mormon. So he's always having to play these mental gymnastics of like, how does, how does he reevaluate Joseph Smith, Sidney Rigdon, Brigham Young? He eventually decides Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. He believes that Sidney Rigdon should have, been the, should have accepted the church. Even though he believes Sidney Rigdon fell away, he still believes Sidney Rigdon, was, since he was the first counselor, should have headed the church. And then he basically hates Brigham Young. He basically is foaming at the mouth against him. He actually blames polygamy. Even though Sidney Rigdon outed Joseph Smith several times in the newspaper, William Bickerton is so angry at Brigham Young that he eventually comes to the conclusion that it wasn't even Joseph Smith that started polygamy. It was Brigham Young. And he's basically saying that, you know what, I just need to completely separate from 
Brigham Young completely. And William Pickerton during this time has this vision, and it's this vision of the, he says that he was carried away into the spirit and placed on a mountain that was room enough just for him to stand. And it said that God was basically encouraging him, saying, this is where you're supposed to be. Keep on this path. But if you, if you don't stay on this path, you'll fall into a, a chasm below, and the sight there is really awful. And so William Bickerton takes this as a prophetic revelation, saying, I'm supposed to carry the church forward. And it's interesting. So he was a devout Mormon. But William Bickerton really starts to retreat back to his Protestant roots, even though he believes in the Book of Mormon. For instance, William Bickerton, under Sidney Rigdon and Brigham Young, would have believed in baptism for the dead. But he didn't, he never agreed with polygamy. But if polygamy is interconnected to baptism for the dead, and it is because it's all about exaltation, right? Becoming a god in the next life or receiving that exaltation in the next life. William Bickerton comes to this idea, well, if polygamy is wrong, then baptism for the dead and the plurality of and the plurality of gods must be wrong because they're all interconnected. So immediately these very Mormon ideals that comes from the Nauvoo period basically go away in, jo in William Bickerton's mind frame. So he's retreating back to his Protestant roots, and he doesn't believe in the temple he, because that's all that's basically temple ordinances. But he still believes in the Book of Mormon. So basically, the Bickertonite Church has the organizational structure eventually very similar to the Mormon Church, where he's going to be ordained a prophet. He's going to have a first and second counselor. He's going to have a quorum of 12, high priests, you know, basically the same exact structure. But the, theologically, it's very much a Protestant church that believes in the Book of Mormon. So that's what makes William Bickerton such a fascinating character. And um, he starts his own movement. So I just want to highlight some of the interesting things about William Bickerton. William Bickerton believed about revelation, even though he's the prophet and he can have revelations. He actually believes that everybody in his congregation can have revelations the same as him. That's including men, that's including women. He might not even necessarily be the only prophet. There's other people in the Bickertonite church, John Dixon, for example, who's recognized as a prophet. William Bickerton's just kind of like the prophet that's leading the church. But other people could be prophets as well. There could even be prophetesses. Oftentimes in congregations, women are not only speaking in tongues, but interpreting messages, and it's for the church. So you see this really egalitarian idea that comes around William Bickerton. He doesn't bar African Americans from holding the priesthood ever. And you can kind of see why he was a coal miner. He went from Virginia, right, moves to Pennsylvania. So he was seeing the stark contrast between the North and the South. And he's, he could probably relate with um, African slaves in a lot of sense because of the degrading circumstances he was as a coal miner. And so he never bars blacks from holding the priesthood, and he even ordains women as part of the ministry. He ordains them as deaconesses. So you see this very egalitarian approach coming out of William Bickerton. And he also, what really makes his movement really pick up the steam in the Pittsburgh area was during the Civil War. Unlike the Mormons in the West who, you know, there's a lot of interesting things that are happening with the Civil War, the Brigham Young did not really see what was happening in the East. They were right smack dab in the middle of the Civil War. Pittsburgh was this huge booming city that was building armaments and weapons for the Union and having railroads. So they're and Gettysburg's not that far. They actually heard the cannons from Gettysburg in Pittsburgh. So William Bickerton has this really interesting idea about the Civil War. He believes in Joseph Smith's Civil War prophecy, which is now uh, DNC 87. And that's interesting because you may say, well, DNC 87 wasn't canonized until much later. And this is why you really need to study William Bickerton, because you really start to see that not only people in the East knew about these things, even before they were canonized out in the West, there's a lot of communication. Sidney Rigdon, even in his Messenger and Advocate newspaper, is talking about Joseph Smith's Civil War prophecy. William Bickerton is in the thick of it, and he really believes, that, just like Brigham Young, this is the apocalypse. Like, this is the beginning of the war that's going to encompass the entire Earth. Brigham Young had the same idea. And when you look at William Pickerton and Brigham Young within an American context, it's really fascinating because most Americans saw the Civil War as what we like to call a post-millennialist catastrophe. The idea that, yeah, God is chastening the nation. You know, Abraham Lincoln eventually comes with, up with that same idea. But the idea is that God's chastening the nation so that way we can come out clean and holy and we can have this great democratic republican utopian society that will eventually become more holy and righteous and then we'll for a thousand years we'll have this millennial utopia and then jesus christ will come down at the very end for a second coming and say good job guys you did it where william bickerton and brigham young are seeing 
the Civil War as an apocalyptic destruction that is going to basically destroy the world so that way Jesus can come down and initiate the millennium. And that, so they're pre-millennialists. So William Pinkerton and Brigham Young are very interesting, and it all stems from Joseph Smith's Civil War prophecy. So I'd like to read an excerpt about that from the book, where after the war, what ends up happening, and what are William Pinkerton's thoughts? And um, it's right here. It says, <clears throat> On April 3rd, 1865, General Robert E. Lee abandoned the town of Petersburg, 24 miles south of Richmond, relinquishing the Confederate capital and sending his troops west of the city. Union troops pushed forward, followed by Abraham Lincoln, who had arrived by boat on the James River. He was accompanied by a guard of ten sailors. In Richmond, he walked through the charred streets, soon surrounded by jubilant black residents, shouting, Glory, 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 and bless the Lord. When one man fell to his knees, Lincoln corrected him. That is not right. You must kneel to God only and thank him for your liberty. Earlier in the day, he himself had remarked to Admiral David D. Porter, Thank God I have lived to see this. It seems to me that I have been dreaming a horrid dream for four years, and now the nightmare is gone. Five days later at Appomattox Court's house, as General Lee surrendered his sword, his eye caught the dark complexion of Eli Parker, a Seneca Indian, who served as General Grant's secretary. I am glad to see one real American here, Lee remarked. We are all Americans, Parker replied with confidence. Indian tribes had fought on both sides during the war, even as additional land was being taken from them, resulting in warfare in Colorado Territory and Minnesota. On Good Friday, five days after Lee's capitulation, the war's dramatic conclusion came in the assassination of Lincoln at a theater in Washington, D.C. Mary Todd Lincoln recounted her husband's wish to visit the Holy Land before he died and see those places hallowed by the footsteps of the Savior. That's a quote. One could understand his longing to see where the original promoter of nonviolence had walked and to experience some rest for himself away from the war. What Bickerton longed to see was the same city, but under different circumstances. He wanted to see the city's glory after Jesus Christ appeared on earth to reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. After that, there would be no more war, a condition he longed for in common with the rest of the nation. So after the war is done, what does William Bickerton believe? Because the war is over. It didn't spread to the rest of the earth like Joseph Smith's Civil War prophecy said. But this is where William Bickerton comes with his really unique idea. He needs to preach to the Native Americans. William Bickerton comes up with this really unique idea that he believes that the choice here that the Book of Mormon talks about, this great prophet that's supposed to gather Israel, right? And it's supposed to kind of initiate the new Jerusalem. William Bickerton actually believes, yeah, Joseph Smith did kind of initiate that and he did translate the Book of Mormon, he's a partial fulfillment of that prophecy, but really, the prophet that's going to rise up and be the real choice there named Joseph is actually going to be a Native American prophet, and he's going to help gather Israel. David Whitmer comes up with a, a similar idea, and they're both separate. And William Dickerson says that we need to go to the Native Americans, and we need to preach to them. So he eventually tries to initiate a movement into Kansas, and he creates, tries to create a communal society, and um, he's basically, Kansas, he it eventually becomes Zion Valley and eventually becomes the town of St. John. And it's right on the edge of Indian territory. He's basically trying to initiate what Joseph Smith had started in 1831 by going to Indian territory. But by this point in the early 1870s, William Bickerton, the Indian, William Bickerton moves to Kansas, which is now the edge of Indian territory. So his whole goal is to preach to the Native Americans with the hopes of this choice year rising up that's going to basically help establish the New Jerusalem. So very much believing in Joseph Smith's Civil War prophecy and believing, believing, <coughs> believing that the remnant are going to rise up and over, you know, vex the Gentiles with a sore vexation, like Joseph Smith's Civil War prophecy says. But here's the problem. William Bickerton wants to go preach to the Native Americans. And every single time he's trying to do this, this major movement this, uh, this, basically this great cataclysmic um, event happens in his church where he's accused of infidelity. And this basically splits his church in two. So what ends up happening, it's like the worst timing necessary. They're about to have this great conference in Kansas that's supposed to advertise their, their success of this new town. They eventually invite people from the east to come to the conference. And at this time, William Bickerton's accused of infidelity. The problem with William Bickerton, he was very egalitarian. And the issue with it is that he had no problem talking with females privately. Usually it was in a public space, but he had no problem talking with them privately. Well, in Victorian America, if you're a married man and you're talking with another married woman, it's considered extremely taboo. 
he ends up, he, he got in trouble with it even in Pennsylvania. One time he took a deepness out there. They went to a public park to chat. Somebody in the church saw them. He had to go before a council meeting, and they're like saying, you can't do that, William Bickerton, but we recognize that, you know, you didn't do anything wrong. He's doing the same thing in, uh, in Kansas. He ended up be, be having this great friendship with this woman named Trifina Taylor, and Trifina was on her deathbed, actually. She's in her 20s. William Bickerton is there. They're in Kansas, and people are basically around Trifina's bed wishing her, like, farewell, and she's basically saying, take care of my kids. William Bickerton goes to the creek, he prays, and he feels directed to go back into the room and say to her, do you believe in Jesus Christ? She says yes, and he says, get up, you're healed. And instantaneously, according to the count, she's healed. He also ended up healing one of her, one of her youngest children. So there's this bond between them. Well, he ends up having this friendship with her. He's in his early 60s. She's in her late 20s. He's got one eye. It, it looks kind of weird that he's having this friendship with this younger woman. And her husband is extremely jealous. His name is James Taylor, just like the musician. There's a lot of musicians in the Bicker tonight, so if I might address. We have a James Brown, a James Taylor. We have a Charlie <laughs> Brown. So if you read the book, it's pretty interesting. And it's our precursor to Alice Cooper. So, uh, <laughs> But anyways... Um, what ends up happening is he, James Taylor is extremely upset with William Bickerton. He brings, brings him before a council. The church council tries to reconvene to figure out, is there anything happening? And the church council says, no, everything's okay. And actually, apparently, it seemed like James Taylor and Trifina and William Bickerton are able to patch things up. Because Trifina and Bickerton are friends. James is like, okay, you guys are just friends, no big deal. And it actually seems like they're really good friends. William Bickerton is actually going on a missionary, one last missionary tour among all the saints in Kansas to kind of get them prepped for this uh, movement to the West to, to preach to the Native Americans. And he actually invites James and Trifina Taylor to go with him. James is even prophesying on this mission that William Bickerton's going to translate the sealed records of the brother of Jared. So you see this very millennialist hope that the millennium and Jesus Christ's second coming and all the promises of the Book of Mormon are going to come forth. But not long after that, there's another accusation by James against his wife and William Bickerton again of, of infidelity because the friendship, he got jealous again. And this is when it blows up. And it's happening right as the conference in Kansas, is the celebratory conference is supposed to come about where they're going to basically make the one last plan to have a preaching mission to Native Americans. So William, the president of the Quorum of Twelve, William Cadman, comes from the East and he's coming for the conference, and he hears about this accusation of infidelity. And he was a staunch advocate for, for William Bickerton for quite some time. They actually were close friends. But for one reason or another, William Cadman actually sides with the people that basically say William Bickerton is a, an adulterer, and he believes James Taylor, while both Trifina and William Bickerton are saying, there's no adultery here, we're just friends. And it... They actually had, for the conference that was supposed to be the celebratory event, actually is a terrible situation because William Bickerton's group is still trying to have a conference prepared for people to move to, na to the Native Americans and proselytize among them, while the, 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 the uh, conference under William Cadman and this other guy named Eli Kendall, they're actually trying to figure out, is William Bickerton an adulterer? And they actually go to William Bickerton's conference, and William Cadman goes there and says, okay, here are the terms. We need to figure out how we're going to try you because this is a serious thing. So William Bickerton actually says, okay, I will actually go before a church court, court, but here's this is our proposal. We'll have three people from my group as part of the jury. We can have three people from your group as part of the jury. And then William Cadman, since you're from the East and you weren't here at all, you, you'll be an objective person. You can be the judge during this church court. And William Cadman goes back to his conference to give the terms that the Bickerton's group said, and the conference says no. We are judging him solely based on our people, and William Bickerton can come if he wants to defend himself, but we already know what the accusation is. So they excommunicate William. So they go back to William Bickerton, tell him is this news, and they say, no, we're not going to do that. That's not fair. And the William Cadman's conference excommunicates William Bickerton. They excommunicate every single person who believes that William Bickerton is innocent. And long story short, the Church of Jesus Christ is actually split in two. You have a, co a large cohort in Kansas and a small little cohort in, in Pennsylvania and Ohio and West Virginia that believe Bickerton is innocent. And the majority of the saints in the East and a small cohort in the West believe that William Bickerton is guilty. So for 22 years, the Church of Jesus Christ is split in two. 
And even though this is such a sad story, this is actually when William Bickerton act finally, after so much turmoil, goes out to preach among the Native Americans, hoping that the choice seer will arise. And that's a whole chapter in the book, which is really fascinating. He's actually living among them, talking with them. And long story short, I'll end with this. William Bickerton, eventually the church does come back together because after 22 years, you have two churches of Jesus Christ basically doing the same exact thing. The membership are the ones that are actually trying to bring the church back together. They're saying, this is ridiculous. We have two churches of Jesus Christ. We basically live in the same exact thing. So the membership is trying to move the, the, the churches together. William Bickerton had tried twice to bring the church back together under his authority, but William Cadman would, would not believe in that and was, would have none of it. So William Cadman eventually sends a friendly face to William Bickerton to kind of make amends, and it's this man named Alexander Cherry, who had once been an apostle in William Bickerton's group, but then eventually moved to William Cadman's group. So they were friends, and Alexander Cherry presents William Bickerton with these terms. Now, mind you, William Bickerton is in his late 80s, William Cadman is almost, is almost a, uh, two decades younger than William Bickerton. William Bickerton knows he's going to die. So Alexander Cherry presents these terms saying, listen, if you're no longer the prophet and you no longer lead the church, you can keep a priesthood position as an elder. And as a result, and every single person that follows you will come back into the church. There are no rebaptisms. There's no reordinations. We'll just have a smooth sailing. And basically the terms are, if you forgive us, we forgive you. And William Bickerton, in his old age, basically says, okay, I have two choices. I can either, uh, I can either die with the church split apart and believe, having my pride, believing I'm innocent, or I could just say, you know what, I'll, I'll take this deal. Everybody comes back together. It's a smooth transition. And basically, William Bickerton smooths the transition, and they come back together. And that's what he chooses. But that's interesting, because the, the deal was the past is forgotten. If you forgive us, we forgive you. He's basically looking at it going, well, you know what, I'm... I'm not an adulterer anymore. Like, they're just recognizing that this was just a big misunderstanding and that everything's going to come back together. So in, that's in that, that happens in 1902. So in 1903, William Bickerton eventually becomes the presiding elder of the St. John, Kansas branch. They invite him to a conference in the East. And William Bickerton, being in his late, being in his late 80s, basically can't come. It's a long trip. So he sends an autobiography instead, knowing that he's going to die soon. And he writes a little autobiography for the church saying, I hope this will be read at the conference. And I actually included it in the back of the book, if everybody wants to read it in full. And he basically says, it's, it's a very straightforward account of his life. There's not really anything damning about anybody else. It's very just very straightforward. But the problem with it is that he's thinking, in his mind, I'm not an adulterer anymore. So he writes the history of the autobiography as left like he is one, it's one straight continuum of him being a servant of God. And when the people in the East read this, they, they, it blows up in conference. They actually are debating a, a break for lunch, and then they debate it some more. And the idea is, okay, we need to come up with an idea, because Cadman's group believes, no, he is an adulterer, and he doesn't even mention this. He doesn't even mention that he was excommunicated and all this stuff. So they basically come up with this political uh, resolution where they say, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to accept the autobiography up to the point of 1880 when you're accused of adultery. And everything after that we just don't accept. And they quietly tuck away the, the document, which William Bickerton was hoping not only to, it to be read to the church, but to be read, eventually to be made as a church tract. Because he said in the, the autobiography, he goes, I'm the organizer of this church. It's only right that I present to you a history. And he was just giving his perspective on it. And when William Bickerton hears about this, his heart is broken, and he's really upset. He actually writes for, to the Saint, one of the St. John newspapers on his 90th birthday. He says, I feel like Job, that the balance of my life, I will wait until my change comes. So unlike Job in the story of the Bible, who basically suffered so much, but at the very end of his life, he got twice as much, right, where God restored everything to him. William Bickerton felt like Job but he knew that he wasn't going to get vindication in his lifetime. He actually says, I have to wait till I die to get vindication. So before he dies, and when he's 90 years old, he asks an apostle, Alan Wright, he says, I want you to use this text as my funeral sermon. And it's, William Bickerton doesn't fight it. He just, he's just heartbroken, but he issues this one last request to Alan Wright. It's kind of like a cry de corps, and, he's, and it's Job 19. So he says, I want you to read Job 19 as my funeral text. And when he dies, when you read Job 19, it's so sad. It's about, my kinsfolk have failed, my familiar friends have forgotten me, my children don't recognize me, they consider my voice strange, my wife has estranged me. I'm paraphrasing, but it's so sad. But there's this other part 
where he says, Job says, Oh, that my words were now written, that they were printed in a book, that they are graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. And it, I will say this, I was halfway through my research when I found out that William Bickerton had asked Job 19 to be read at his funeral, and I was blown away because when I read that, I said, holy cow, not only did he like, have a premonition that his side of the story would not be told for a really long time, he actually was crying from the grave, please someone write my story. So as a historian looking into this, I had no idea. So I tried to be very objective while writing the book, but at the same time, it's kind of humbling when you realize, holy cow, I'm fulfilling this guy's dead wish. Like, it's really a sad story. It's so sad. And that's what ends up happening. He has this, uh, he issues that uh, proclamation, and for over a century, William Bickerton was in the shadows. And hopefully he's not in the shadows anymore. And uh, it's really a tragedy. So this, this biography is really, you can kind of look at it as a, as a, as a real-life tragedy within the Latter-day Saint movement. And uh, thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Questions? Yes, Gary. So I, I do have a bunch of questions, um, but I'll, I'll ask only one. Um, and this relates to the church today, your church today. Um, I'm kind of curious where it sits on the spectrum of LDS, Community of Christ, in terms of current political, social, economic kinds of issues. Okay. So social, so do you want me to talk about like the religious side of things first and then kind of go social? Sure. Okay. So religiously, the Bickertonites believe that the Bible and Book of Mormon are divine texts that were, so they believe the Book of Mormon is a divinely translated text. Um, they believe that Joseph Smith was inspired of God to do that, very similar to the LDS Church. Unlike the Community of Christ, that kind of like, you know, some people believe in it and some people don't, and that's okay. In the Bickertonite Church, you really do have to believe in the Book of Mormon as a divinely inspired translation. Um, so that's kind of the interesting history, the religious side of things. Um, regarding socially, the culturally... Daniel? When, when you say have to, do you mean you'll get in trouble if you don't? Well, that's a good question. Um, when, before you get baptized, they do, at, they do talk to you about the Book of Mormon and ask if you believe it. And um, most of the time, they're really looking for an answer of like, yes, I do believe in it, or if the church believes in it, I believe in it. And they really are looking for, do you, do you accept this book as scripture? So are they asking if you accept it as ancient? No, they don't ask that. Okay. So, hypothetically, even though probably the leadership of the church and most priesthood people would say they wouldn't accept this, but oftentimes they don't ask that. So if somebody wanted to accept the, the Book of Mormon as like, maybe it's really uh, inspiring fiction that they accept as scripture, that might be okay. It just depends on who you ask, but they probably wouldn't push it. But normally they would say, no, you have to accept it as a divinely inspired text. Culturally, it's very similar. Um, even though the Bickertonites don't believe, necessarily believe in the word of wisdom, like they don't use it, um, they don't really even use the Doctrine and Covenants anymore. That's what's interesting. Bickerton did use the Doctrine and Covenants, or at least parts of it, but eventually after his death, they kind of do away with that. So they don't read the word of wisdom, but they basically follow it. Like, um, they, they, don't, they, say they, they say you shouldn't smoke. They will allow somebody, if they're, if they're a smoker, they will allow them to join the church, but you can't hold an ordained office. Uh, they really advise against drinking alcohol, but if, you know, with the large Italian influx in the early 20th century, <laughs> it's kind of hard telling Americans who make, or Italian-Americans who make wine in their basement, you can't have some with your pasta dinner. So they usually say, uh, just do it in private. Actually, the Italian-Americans actually were making their own wine and using it for the sacrament, so it's pretty interesting. Um, so they will say, most of the time they say, don't drink alcohol, but if you do it privately or you're not going crazy, they, they won't say anything. All alcohol, beer too. Yeah. Yeah, they'll say, don't, don't do it, but if you do it, just do it privately or just do it casually and don't like, um, don't do it in a sense where it, there's a, an appearance of evil. So if somebody was, so they would consider, when I say appearance of evil, in their minds they would say, don't go to a bar and get rowdy or don't go to a rowdy bar if somebody sees you there, but if you want to like, I mean, if, if somebody had a glass of wine or beer at dinner, you know, at Applebee's, probably people wouldn't care. So it's 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 very sim similar culturally with, the, but you know, but they're not as strict as the word. They kind of they basically follow the word of wisdom, like Joseph Smith and uh, Brigham Young follow the word of wisdom. <laughs> not like to, not like today, where it's more strict. So um, so culturally, it's very similar. So 
when I go to BYU, I have no problems, you know, interacting with the people because it's it's very it's very similar culturally. I hope that. Is there any other thing around that, Gary? Um, so, so you're talking about some of the behavioral things. What about politically? Yeah, politically, that's a fun question. Somebody needs to do more work on that. The bigger tonight's. The leadership almost never gets, never, they never get involved with politics. It's really, it's, you, I am shocked if I hear anything from the pulpit that's about politics. It's almost never talked about. And Bicker Tonight's are all along the spectrum. I know people who support Trump and I know people who hate Trump. And I know there's a lot of people in the middle. Believe it or not, I think a lot of people in Pennsylvania, they're mostly Democrats because they grew up in that area. It's coal mining, it's blue collar workers, and they believe it. They believe in the. So even in the last election, I know several people in Pennsylvania who voted democratically, even though you know the Republicans are very socially conservative. So there's still this tradition, but I know lots of bigger tonight's that vote Republican. It just depends on who you ask. So I actually think it's pretty split. It's pretty interesting, especially growing up in South Florida most of my life. I know most of the people there are Democratic, because um, it's not really the South until you get north of Orlando. <laughs> but, you know, it just depends on where you are. Some, where, where you would expect, uh, like in Ohio and the rural areas, most people are conservative. But if you go to cities like Pittsburgh and South Florida and California, most of the memberships are Democratic. So they kind of follow demographically where Americans fit. But bigger tonight's are very are very are very good Americans in a sense where they just don't they they don't really the church doesn't really uh, uh, try kind of relegate to tell them what to believe they kind of believe in what they want to believe the church doesn't even have an official stance on abortion I think most people would probably really advise against it they would say it's really difficult you know if there was an issue with health they probably would say okay but I've never heard of somebody having an abortion and um, being held to a church council meeting by anything like that. Um, so it it really it really just depends. Yeah. Is there a specific attitude uh, so far as the Wicked Night leadership is concerned regarding the LGBT issue? Yeah, that's a great question. So regarding the LGBT issue, the Church of Jesus Christ, when same sex marriage came out, they came out with an official statement basically saying, as a church, we don't do these marriages. But they're basically advising, don't judge people. You know, people. You know, people ha may have a right to do it, but as a church, we won't. We we won't do it. So it was kind of similar to um, the LDS church. But the addition is, was, see, the vicar tonight's kind of get away. They can say that because a lot of Christian churches do that, right? They would. A lot of Christian churches say, don't judge. You know, LGBT. You know, people. They're, they're still children of God. God still loves them. They still have, you know, access to the gospel. But, you know, regarding marriage, we don't necessarily want to do this. But, see, with the LDS, they have that policy of, right, like if you're eight years old and you can get baptized, but you have LGBT parents, you can't get baptized. Well, within the Bigger Tonight Church, the age of accountability is, I don't know, maybe around 12 and up. I've heard of rare instances where children are baptized around 10, maybe even a little bit younger, but that's like real old. Most of the time, they're usually 12, 13, and up. So it's a believer's baptism. So they don't have to deal with those same issues because if it's a believer's baptism and you're old enough to make your own decisions, they're not going to really care if your parents are LGBT. They'll just say, oh, you want to get baptized? And they'll say, they'll probably go over the, the doctrine and say, do you believe this? And they'll say, do you understand that, you know, even though your parents are this, we don't, we won't, we don't marry people. And if they say, okay, I would assume, even though I don't think we've ever had that instance happen, but it's, it's not hard for them to get baptized because it's their own, under their own accord. They're basically an adult where they can make that decision for themselves so they'd be totally okay with it. If a gay couple came to a meeting and sat and held hands, yeah. would, that, would, would they feel comfortable and accepted in that situation? I guess it depends on which branch you go to. Um, I, know where that's hap I know where that's happened and it's just, you know, they're just coming for a visit and it's, it's okay. Nobody's going to stop them from doing that. Now, if they wanted to get baptized, they probably would have to say, you know, this is the church's stance, you know, and that would be, they kind of follow the same LDS line where they say, well, if you're, if you're, if you, if you have homose, if you're, if you have homosexual attraction, you can't, um, you can't, you can't really act on it. So it's similar to the LDS. So that's, we, you're starting to see little bits and pieces of that, especially with the millennials coming out where that's kind of, you know. It's, it'll be interesting to see what happens to the Vicar Tonight Church as socially things kind of move forward in the 21st century and how they're going to deal with that. But the Vicar Tonight's really haven't had to deal with that as much as the LDS Church has had to do. And it really just depends on who you talk to within the membership. Some membership, some members are open to it, others aren't, and it just 
It really just depends. And so the, the leadership really hasn't taken, um, other than that one statement, and other than what I've told you, it's really based on a case-by-case -case basis, and it's, and it's done with them. And quite frankly, that's above my pay grade, and I'm so thankful for that. <laughs> so I don't have to answer those questions, because <laughs> I have my thoughts on that. So, yeah. Um, you talked about the conferences that Vickerton tried to establish, things like that. Now, where are conferences held? In the, Vicar, or in the Church of Jesus Christ? Right? Gen general conferences are held in, usually in Pennsylvania, in Greensburg, which is their World Conference Center. Yeah, okay, I will say something. This is my little pet peeve, and I say this at church, and I have fun with it. I have no idea why the Church of Jesus Christ has their headquarters in Monongahela, Pennsylvania. I think it's probably because what's on the charter. They don't do tr general business there. It's always done in Greensburg at the he World Headquarters. So I always joke saying, like, it's the Church of Jesus Christ bicker tonight, and then they say they do their general conferences at Greensburg. Because I, I just think it's silly that they hold on to Monaga Hale. I guess it's easier, because I'm assuming that's where the char their latest charter is located. But yeah, they do most of their conferences there, and then they'll have regional conferences, and they'll just pick a branch within that region, and they'll have a regional conference there. And where... Uh, when is when is conference held? Uh, it's similar, same as the LDS Church. They have two general conferences, one in April and one in October. So thanks for the thanks for the uh, the, the, the example to follow. No, no that, that started in the original church. Don't give the Mormons any no. credit. <laughs> and then a follow, a follow up to what you just said. So is anything unique about Monagahea or and that church? Meaning, what occurs there versus any no. of the other branches? No. But, but Daniel, it was for decades the general offices. That's, that's true. Where conferences were held up until the conference center was built and dedicated in 1970. That's true. 72. That's a good point. So I mean, from from the 1920s or 30s when that building was built, that was. Yeah. So before the the conference center was built, yeah. that's where it, that really was the headquarters. But once that the conference was built, they moved all things there, but they still keep it. So yeah, let me. That's a good point. Let me rephrase that. So from from that for, movement, from once they build the general conference center forward, they do all their general business there, but they still hold the headquarters there. So before that, yeah, it, it did play a prominent role, and it's and it's a pretty historic building. It's from the early 20th century. It was dedicated and. It's a beautiful building, so yeah. Well, we've talked about that. I've I've actually attended church there a few times. And, yeah, and uh, yeah, but it was it was quite interesting. Yeah. Um, so we followed your example and built a conference center then. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So before before we, I answer questions, these are good. I want to make a comment. So some of you had even Michael and I know Joe. You had gone. I think you had gone there. They used to have an 1830 first edition in under glass at the Monongahela branch. And I think they were told by people, hey, this is pretty worth a lot of money. You better might want to put this somewhere else. So I think now it's in a, I'd, I'd have to ask, don't quote me on this. I think it's in a safety deposit box now. I think they kind of took people's ideas like, oh, this is, this is probably not a good idea. So it's interesting. So, and they have, a, they have a, uh, just a copy uh, there. There, there, there's, you know, I don't, I don't even know if it's a facsimile of the 1839. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I haven't been when, there Last time I looked at it, it didn't look like a facsimile. It looked just like. An old copy that somebody. Well, did. we'll donate okay. a facsimile if you don't have one. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what they have in their glass now. Let me know. I have to go back there and see. Michael, did you have a question? I'll, I'll get around to everybody. Yeah, I have a, a question. Um, they may discuss what were some of the contemporary sources that you know, exist about William Bickerton being baptized into uh, Sidney Riggins Church of Christ. And also into you know Brigham Young's Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and, and how long was he a member of the, uh, the Latter-day Saint Church with headquarters in Salt Lake City? Okay, and that's a good that's a good spe that's a specific question. I can hope I can answer. Okay, so when he was baptized in Sidney Rigdon's church, it doesn't mention it in Bickert and uh, Sidney Rigdon's newspaper, but we do know that William Bickerton was a member because of the newspaper. Uh, William Bickerton's writings say that he joined in June of 1845 and he was baptized. He was baptized by John Fraser, one of Rigdon's high counselors, and that's in a couple sources. Um, regarding his baptism in the LDS church, uh, it's in the Bickertonite Minutes. It's also in, um, it's also in, uh, in some of the LDS writings and journals, because what's interesting is 
after when the, I forgot to mention this, when the church splits up for 22 years, the LDS church hears about this. It goes all the way up to John Taylor, and they actually send Mormon missionaries into the Bickertonites, both in Pennsylvania and in Kansas, and they convert quite a few Bickertonites because of all the turmoil that's happening. So you can read those missionaries' journals and see that they were also baptized. They, they, they kind of recount the stories that they're hearing. And they also say that as well. So it all, so it's nice. So you get William Bickerton's accounts basically, and then you get other other contemporary accounts, and they all match each other pretty nicely. And William Bickerton was about a member of Sidney Rigdon's church for about 10, 11 months, and he was about the same for uh, Brigham Young's church. He was a, a member for about 10 months. So he's a member of Sidney Rigdon and Brigham Young's church for about the same exact time, which is really interesting. He was, he he was his, an, for a coal miner. He really had, he was really smart, but he also was a very independent thinker, and he definitely was not afraid to uh, go on his own convictions, which makes him such an interesting figure to, to look at. Was there any yeah, questions? I never questions? had one. Yeah. Well, just look. Do you see that today's membership in the church <clears throat> interested to go back and learn about Bickerton? Do you see your book, the W Widespread Interest? In I hope so. There's been. There's more, a lot more interest. I was hoping there'd be interest, and there's actually more interest than I was expecting, which I was so thankful. It really seems to be selling well. Even people that I didn't expect to read the book are reading the book. So um, can we set up a table at General Conference or something? Yeah, I wish we could set up a table at General Conference. Probably not. <laughs> the big issue is the William Cadman and William Bickerton feud. A lot of the leadership is, a, you know, they don't want to talk about that. But to me, it's... It's no big deal. These guys are both dead. Like, you know, who cares if they, they... There was no serial killers. Nobody, you know, mass murdered anybody. So, I mean, it's just a big just a big fight. But, yeah, thankfully, I actually had one story. I, I, I There was a, a woman I know in the church that we're basically friends, and she's very bold, and, and I can trust her opinion. She actually flat out said to me, she goes, you know, I'll be honest with you, Daniel. I wasn't going to tell you. I actually thought I was going to hate your book. <laughs> and, she, and she said, but I read it, and I really liked it. She said, I really did. So I was so thankful to hear that. Mm -hmm. So I think the Vicar Tonight's are not afraid of hearing about their own history. There seems to really be an interest. I really didn't essentially... I guess, I mean, even though I tried to be objective, it's kind of nice because, you know, I'm trying to rehabilitate Bickerton's uh, com uh, commitment to the church. You know, and some historians could say, well, that's apologetics, right? But the, ish the nice thing about my church is that he's been so tucked away and not talked about, trying to rehabilitate him is actually going against the grain of the church history. <laughs> so I get to be, a, I not only get to be an objective historian, but I also actually get to rehabilitate the founder without being con Maybe, maybe some people might consider me apologetic, but most likely not. I haven't been called that. So it's kind of nice. I kind of get a, a pass-free card on that. So, yes. I don't know if you mentioned this earlier, but I'm curious uh, about the church structure. So what is the hierarchy? What does it consist of? And do you proselytize? How do you grow? Yeah, so I'll answer the first question. The big proselytizing now among the Bickertonites is going to the Native Americans. That is really the big push because they still believe in the jo choice here being a Native American prophet that's going to rise up. And a lot of the Native American tribes believe that a leader or leaders are going to come up to save them from their situation within American society. So the Bickertonites used to be interested in con conversions. Now they're not so much. What they're doing is they're going out west and they're basically saying, listen, this is what we believe about you. We believe that you're a chosen people of God. Uh, we believe that God's going to use you in the last days, but we want to learn about you. So they're not really looking for conversions as they're more looking for contacts and friendships. And they're getting more, because that new, because they're doing it that way, they've actually seen much, they're getting a ton more contacts than they used to. And now the main push is going there. So now they're going to like Oklahoma, North Dakota, all over the, the country. So what's interesting is the, 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 the demographics now, the Bickertonites are, are really along the eastern coast quite a bit. They're in the Midwest quite a bit. They're very sporadically throughout the West. There's no, there's no congregations in Utah. So a lot of them don't even know about Vicar tonight's, but then there's there's strong congregations in Arizona, and there's quite a bit in California. So there's really along both coastlines, and then within the Midwest, and then dabbles within the you know like the the plains and things like that. So and the hierarchy. Yeah, the hierarchy of the church under Bickerton, it was eventually what it comes out to be is you have a prophet, president, first and second counselor, and they're the presidency or the first presidency, just like the LDS Church. You have a quorum of twelve apostles. Then you have patriarchs, you have um, high priests, 
then you have evangelists. And evangelists and patriarchs in Bickerton's church are not the same thing. So that's an interesting, that's a little different. Mm -hmm. Patriarchs would bestow blessings on people, it appears, but evangelists, their job was to go evangelize, to go mm -hmm. preach. So, and there would be, and sometimes they would call them 70s, but it was basically the same thing. And then you had elders, and that was the Melchizedek priesthood. And then, for the, they don't have an Aaronic priesthood. They never did, and even they still don't today. But they, it's similar because in William Bickerton's church, you had the Melchizedek priesthood, and then you had ancillary positions that were kind of like part of the ministry, and they were, um, they were priests, teachers, deacons, and deaconesses. So they're kind of considered part of the ministry or an arm of the ministry, but they don't hold the Melchizedek priesthood. And now, so that was Bickerton's. Now it's actually changed. We have a quorum of 12 apostles, and they lead the church. The presidency now is within the quorum. Mm -hmm. so, so we don't have 15 apostles. We only have 12. And they'll choose the president and first and second counselor that lead the church within the 12. Then you have evangelists. They don't have patriarchs anymore. You have elders, and that is the Melchizedek priesthood. And then you have teachers, deacons, and deaconesses. We don't have priests anymore. And I, so it's, it's, it's really changed over time. So there's a, really, this is, it's really rare in American religion where you find a rock that has never been unturned. You know, most people who are doing, writing books or trying to get graduate degrees, they're trying to find that little nook of the rock that nobody's looked at. This is literally a book, a, a, not only the, like a, a, a movement with an American religion that's pretty darn significant, and it's completely open for the taking. Anybody can jump into it. So it's really fun and exciting, but at the same point, you're kind of left to kind of, be a trailblazer at the same time, so it's it's open. It's an open field. Is the membership about twenty thousand? Is that what I heard? Yeah, it's about twenty three thousand now. So there is about three thousand in the U S. and Canada, which is not you know it's pretty a small, fairly small. Three thousand in the U S. and Canada, a lot in Mexico, a ton in Africa, and a lot in India. So they're in twenty about twenty three countries. It's twenty three countries now. Last time I checked, about twenty nearly twenty three thousand members. And most of the Bigger Tonight Church is not white, just like the LDS Church. You kind of have the main, the, the main, you know, decisions are mostly made in America, but in Mexico and in Africa, a ton in Africa. That's in India, Nepal, Philippines. There's a lot of congregations there, so pretty interesting. But it's been pretty stable within the U.S. About three thousand domestically. They really hope they really believe in the Native Americans that something good's going to happen in the near future. That really is the focus of the Bigger Tonight Church today. Yeah. Do you uh, publish your own version of the Book of Mormon? Yeah, the Bickerton Knights do publish their own version of the Book of Mormon. And do they have um, a magazine? Uh, how do they disseminate ideas? Yeah, they have a magazine now. It's called the Gospel News, and that's kind of how they disseminate their ideas. Um, within the Book of Mormon, the, the Bickerton Knight Church does publish their own Book of Mormon. It's, ex it's basically the same as the LDS version. It's the same chapters. It's the same verses. There is a, there's minor, very minor word, uh, word um, changes of words that don't correlate. But it's so minor, it doesn't, it doesn't change the mean, really the meaning of anything. The only reason for that is because the Bicker Tonight's kind of use a compilation of several versions of the Book of Mormon that put theirs together. But even how it's, you know, how the Book of Mormon, the LDS version of the Book of Mormon now is you have the references at the bottom. The Bicker Tonight Book of Mormon follows that same exact pattern and they have the references but they don't have, instead of referencing like the Doctrine and Covenants or Polar Great Price, you just have Bible and Book of Mormon references. But the style, the same versification is basically the same, is exactly the same. I have a question just on that. Uh, what versions, is it after the 1830 or what, what versions is it taken? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I think it's three versions. I don't want to say it exactly because I forget the exact dates, but it's it's in the front of the, of the of, of a Church of Jesus Christ bicker a Book of Mormon that you can read it and they explain how they did it. So, but yeah, that's a good question. I, I just I just can't remember off the top of my head. I don't believe it's the 1830 edition. So, they, it's other versions. Was there, yeah, there we go. Since you've studied Mormon, does any, are there other Bickertonites that have the passion for Mormon history that, that you do, that you know of, or? Um, I'm the only one that I know of that has <clears throat> tried to get a degree, a graduate degree in history and get a PhD in it. Um, there are people that have uh, degrees in like archaeology and history, but as far as I know, no graduate degrees, and nobody has really published um, from an independent press things about the church. I think I'm the first one, and I'm saying that humbly because I, 
as far as I know, I think I'm the only one. So I'll be honest with you, it's lonely. That's why I hang out with you guys. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm not here because I it's that I love learning from you all. So thanks. with that being the case, are you when you look at Joseph Smith's revelations, do you think, wow, it'd be cool if we could adopt some of these revelations or the DNC? Do you think that you guys would gain from it, or you think you're fine the way it is? Or you know what, the first, the first few in the DNC, the Bickertonites would totally. Agree. Bickerton did. Bickerton really agree, agreed a lot with the DNC. It's interesting. There was this one conference in Kansas where they actually were going to make a definitive statement as the Bickertonite Church and say, okay, these are the doctrine and covenants that we agree with, and these are the ones that we don't. And then it got tabled, and it never happened. So if they would have done that, I really wonder how it would have continued on within the tradition. But because that never happened, it just kind of got tucked away. So most Bickertonites are really surprised when I tell them that William Bickerton believed in a lot of the Doctrine and Covenants. I'm like, oh, he knew the Doctrine and Covenants like the back of his hand. He quotes them in the newspaper articles all the time. And you know, he's, he's referencing them in his sermons and things about that nature. And it blows people away. They're like, really? They're even shocked that, well, even though today it's called the Church of Jesus Christ, back then it was called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, no hyphen. And they eventually incorporate the church as the Church of Jesus Christ, but they're constantly using both. So, you know, today it's often a common thing to be like, we're not Latter-day Saints, but it's like, yes, we were. So they're like, I had a couple people say that was probably the biggest shock for me was that we were called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Something so simple, and it really, like, stuns <laughs> people like, oh, my gosh, really? So I said, yeah, I said, we can't say that. But I always joke. I said, we have that Saints hymnal where we sing that, that hymn where it's good to be a saint of Latter-day. So i like, you know, like, let's not mince words too much. It's totally okay to be called that. <laughs> yeah. What, what would you say the, the general attitude of Booker tonight is toward the comparatively enormous Utah church? Uh, I think a lot of it is like, I've heard a couple go, man, like, how come we can't do like they're doing? And they got polygamy. <laughs> like, you hear people say that stuff, and you're just like, oh, come on. Well, you know, the idea is that. There's a lot of respect for the LDS Church and the Bigger Tonight community. They really recognize the humanitarian efforts, the things that the LDS Church is doing. I have <coughs> immense respect for the LDS Church quite a bit. Um, it just depends on who you ask. It really depends. Because some people will be like, oh, you know, there's still that stigma of like, I mean, nobody thinks that the LDS people have horns or anything like that. But they'll say like, oh, well, you know, um, you know, like we, they'll say that's, they're, they're Mormons, you know. But other people are like, oh, they're Mormons. It just depends on who you talk to. It really depends on who's educated about it and has read it and who knows other LDS people and those who don't. So you still see a stigmatization, very similar to the community of Christ, uh, the reorganized church in a lot of ways, what the reorganized church was. I was so. just going to ask that. What are the attitudes toward the community of Christ? You know what? I don't think a lot of people know about the community of Christ, believe it or not. That's what the Bigger Tonights are very, um, I don't want to say this in a negative way, but they're very. Uh, they're not closed-minded, they're exclusive in a lot of ways. They're very much um, insular. Not, insular. Yeah, they're very much looking at themselves mostly. Yeah. As John Hamer jokes from the community <coughs> Christ, he says, oh, they're, they're the little church, the little stone that keeps rolling along that doesn't care about the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really a funny way, but actually kind of a, a really accurate way to describe the Bicker Tonights in a lot of sense. They're not so interested in talking with a lot of the... Uh, they, they do every once in a while talk with other groups of the Restoration. We've had bits and pieces of it, like Steve Shields had talked about that even, but it's it's not often. I actually think, and I say this humbly, I think I'm, I've am i talked with more people from Latter-day Saint movements than probably most people in the, in the Church of Jesus Christ have, and it's been a very enriching, opening experience because I recognize there's way more similarities than there are differences. So, yes, yeah, Steve? The question brings up a question that struck me throughout the book as I read it. Um, it seems like Bickerton was completely off the radar of the reorganized church and vice versa. Yeah. All throughout those you know, like 1860s, 70s, when the when the reorganized church missionaries were out trying to gather the scattered saints, you know, Bickerton's off in Pennsylvania or Kansas. Yeah. And the, the, the paths never seem to have crossed. No. Ever. Well, yeah, it's until a great. recent years. You're absolutely right. William Bickerton <clears throat> was keeping abreast of what Brigham Young was doing, loathed Brigham Young. But at the same point, I don't even, I'm looking at William Brigham Young's writings, I don't even think William Brigham Young even knew about William Bickerton. John Taylor eventually. 
found out, the reorganized church knew about the Bickertonites because there was some communication with there. There was some proselyti trying to proselytizing on both sides for the reorganized church and the Bickertonites meeting in the Midwest trying to kind of convert one another. But yeah, among the Utah church and Bickertonites and Bickerton's day, it doesn't really even seem like the Bickertonites were on the Utah church's radar. And they were growing pretty quickly. I mean, even for a small little church, they're growing by the hundreds during the Civil War and afterwards, and they're preaching among the Native Americans. It's when you start to see them go into Kansas and they start entering, you know, the Utah church's territory is when you start to finally see. Because they're actually, when you read the writings of the missionaries, they're like, hey, did you hear about this group? You actually see a surprise in them. And John Taylor is excited to send it so that he sends it down the channels to go see this group because they're curious. So you actually start to see a, a curiosity among the Utah church. And I even venture to say a, uh, a newness where they're like, who are, who are these people? So it's, it's interesting. I'm also curious with, since the Book of Mormon is so important to Baker tonight, <coughs> are any, like, do people care about, like, def defending it or writing commentaries about it? If, if so, do you have your own scholars? Does anybody ever utilize, because there's so many in LDS tradition that write that stuff, yeah. do you guys ever utilize any of that to kind of boost faith or anything like yeah. that? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Okay. I've seen, it, it just depends on who you talk to. People who are, are who are educated about the UDS, LDS literature, I have seen them use it. And I've even used it to help to do lessons. So it it does help, when, but it just depends like on- Like Hugh Nibley known in the- No, uh, no, uh, you would tell an average <laughs> because I, who's, they would say, I've used Hugh Nibley, they'd be like, who's that? Okay. Like, <laughs> they, they, <laughs> now in the Utah group, you're like, oh, who doesn't know Hugh Nibley, but yeah. It's, do you have your own writers that do a lot of that as well, like in the magazine and that type of thing? Yeah, or? James Le James V. Lavalvo was really prominent in the 70s and 80s. He wrote a lot of books, he was an apostle. Uh, he got his master's degree, I think, from a Mennonite seminary. So he was pretty well educated, and he was considered a theologian. So he wrote a lot, and that's where a lot of the church is now. Um, sometimes, but see, James Lee, James Lavavo. I'll be honest with you. Very rarely do I hear Bigger tonight even read his books. I have all his books. I think it's really interesting because I'm a historian. I want to know what has been said in the past. But the church now really doesn't publish pamphlets and uh, the theological discourses like it used to. The Gospel News even used to, which is their, their uh, newsletter or newspaper, used to publish a lot of theological discourses. And now even, it, it doesn't, it's much more, um, uh, it's much more about like, oh, here's what happened at this branch, or here's what happened at the recent GMBA camp out, which is like, a, 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 which is basically like a, a, a summer retreat for the church when they usually go to college campuses. And they're saying, oh, here's these baptisms, and here are these blessing bits, and the blessing bits, they call them in the back, where people had a miracle happen and they're thanking God. It's, you don't see a lot of the, the, the deep theological discussions happening. And I'm really wondering, as a, as somebody in the Bigger Tonight Church, I'm really wondering socially, <coughs> as this progresses and as the millennials start to take over the church, believe it or not, I guess I'm a millennial technically, I didn't know that, I thought I was past that, but apparently I am, <laughs> um, and uh, as the, uh, they start taking over, I see some people my age kind of getting into things theologically, but it's very much based on the Bible and Book of Mormon. Um, they're looking at other writings, but you don't see a lot of scholarship or even writings written for the church, so... It's not like it used to be. I really wonder what's going to happen, and I actually think it probably needs to pick up because the LDS Church is really doing some amazing things, especially with the openness and the transparency of the Church History Library. It's like it's unprecedented. So I don't know. The, the Vicar Knights have a lot of catching up to do on that front. I think. In the archives that you accessed, where are they at, and how large is it? Is it is it just open for? certain people by appointment or not even that or yeah you have to make an appointment you have to get permission I even as a vicar tonight I had to get permission I had to write a proposal to the apostles I had to get permission from the church historian and when I went into the archive it's much betterly organized but really it's a room in the Greensburg headquarters in the, the Greensburg Conference Center that's the main archives they have a lot of things electronically and then I got a there's a there's a private archive uh, in New Mexico by a gentleman John Mancini he's got a ton of stuff and you had to get you had to get special permission from him. But other than that, that's, that's I actually had to find original documents from several people in the church. Like, And you, you might say, well, how do you validate it? But it, you could tell it was original because there's no, there's no, for, there's really no forgeries in the Bickert Tonight Church. There. But like I had to, I actually have at my home that I eventually do plan, on, after all my research of the years, I plan on giving it to the church archive. I have actual church minutes from like 1891, like the actual pieces of paper. I have things from like the 18, uh, yeah, 1890s, 1891, 1880s, 
I have, I have quite a few things that I just need to give back, which I do plan on giving back, because I was able to collect them while doing it. So that was another reason I think I got access to the archive, because I did tell them, whatever I collect, I'll give to you guys, and I still plan on doing that. I just haven't had, I plan on making my Pittsburgh trip eventually to uh, later this year, and probably take my daughter to Daniel Tiger's neighborhood while we're there, so make an excuse. <laughs> so that was private hand stuff that you acquired that you some of then it. give over to the archive? Yeah, some of that. it too. So what I would do is, is when I did that, some of it, like, the archive might have already had, but I had the original document, so it, it's, it's all cited to the archive because technically that's where it's at. So I just got to give back some of those things that I had. Yeah. Yeah. I apologize. I, I arrived late, oh, no so I'm sure you ad addressed this, but you talked about uh, him being a, a, a member of Brigham's Church for mm -hmm. a while and uh, other churches for a while. What, and yet it seems like they've adopted so much of the, the basics. What was the, uh, what was the difference that caused this independence to, to uh, split in an, uh, another faction? It was a pol it was polygamy. Yeah. When William Bickerton he when he joined the LDS Church in Pennsylvania, he was told by the missionaries that they weren't practicing polygamy. But when he finds out in March of 1852 that an announcement's coming out in August, he feels betrayed. He feels like, I thought you guys weren't practicing polygamy, and that's where the major break-off happens. So the Vicar Tonight's never agreed with polygamy from the, from the get-go, which, again, what kind of makes him an interesting character because a lot of people, you know, the schismatic groups, like James Strang, he says, I don't believe in polygamy, and then he's, <laughs> and then he's <laughs> going into the East with his... His, uh, his his female companion that's dressed as a man, you know, and he's practicing <laughs> polygamy. So William Bickerton, is, now being the third largest Latter-day Saint church, he really did not believe in polygamy from the moment of conception. So it really, he was a very staunch person against that. So, and even the adultery allegation, I did wonder, was this an, was this kind of a polygamous thing? But it, it really wasn't. There's no evidence for that. It really just looked like it was a friendship that blew out of proportions and there was no issue of polygamy. So, yeah, it, it makes them quite unique. Was there any other questions? Gary, did you have your hand up earlier? Did you, did I understand correctly that you're, that Alice Cooper is a member? Yeah, Alice Cooper grew up in the church, uh -huh. so he never actually was baptized as far as I know, but that's what's interesting. So his parents were? Oh yeah, he okay. was like, really grew up in the church. His, his grandfather was named, his name was uh, Thurman Furnier, and he was not only an apostle in the church, but he was a president of the church at one point. His father was named, we, call, we say Ether, but Ether Moroni Furnier. That's his father. <laughs> yeah, and, and Alice Cooper is actually Vincent Furnier. So I have a funny story with that. Um, believe it or not, so there's this, I, grew, I love classic rock and garage rock growing up. So <clears> my, the only thing I have left from that era is my hair. I've kept that. But he, uh, what's interesting is that... Um, when I listened to Alice Cooper a long time, I really loved that song, No More Mr. Nice Guy. Well, there's this verse in No More Mr. G no, nurse, a nice Guy where he says, I went to church incognito, and everybody rose, and Mr. Smithy recognized me and punched me in the nose, saying, No More Mr. Nice Guy. And my mother-in-law was the one saying, Oh, that's about Ike Smith, who was an apostle in the church, because Alice Cooper, or Vinny, Vincent Furnier, grew up in the Detroit area, which I am now. So I know people who actually grew up with Alice Cooper, and they actually say, you know what? Vinny always dressed differently. He was always trying to be unique. So they kind of, it's not a bad thing to give him credit to always kind of being beating by his own drum. And eventually, uh, Vincent Furnier, Alice Cooper, moves to Arizona. And in Arizona, there was an apostle named Ike Smith. And I was like, no, Mom, that's not about Ike Smith. So, But I looked up online, and I saw, oh, it's about his Mormon bishop or whatever. Some people, somebody said this, and maybe it is. So... Funny enough, a couple months ago, Ike Smith, he's no longer an apostle. He stepped down honorably. He was just getting older, and he said, you know what, I, let somebody else take over. I'm getting older. He was in town, and he had heard about me writing the book, so he wanted to talk to me about history in a good way. He was really interested. We had this great conversation. We went to dinner with him, and my wife was really bold. Out of a sudden, I don't know her. She just goes, okay. Okay, Brother Ike, is it true? Are you the Mr. Smithy, according to Alice Cooper's song, that punched, that punched him in the nose? And his wife, Bonnie, starts laughing and goes, that's where that comes from. She, she goes, we've heard things like that, and we had no idea what they were talking about. And, uh, and Ike Smith goes, no, I did never punched Vincent in the nose. <laughs> so it's really funny. Yeah, there was actually another guy, another guy that we know that was from the Latter-day Saint movement, met Ike Smith. I forget his name. Really a nice guy. Anyways, he actually went to, I think it was either a concert or a meet and greet with Alice Cooper, because Ike Smith showed me the photo on his phone, 
and he asked, and he was talking about him, he go, and he's telling Alice Cooper, hey, I know, I know Ike Smith. And Alice Cooper says to him, goes, tell him Vinny says hi. <laughs> and they got the picture. So there's still, some, there's still some friendships there. But yeah, so Alice Cooper is the, is the, he never really was an official Vicar Tonight, but he totally grew up in the Vicar Tonight Church. So The most important question why did you and Devery not get him to write the foreword for your book? Oh my gosh, I don't know. That is awesome. That's awesome. I know. I actually have a, a, a church history that Thurman Furnier, his grandfather, wrote, and it was actually kind of like people. Some people didn't like it. It never was published. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think I'd have to double check the document, so don't quote me. But I think it was kind of tucked away. But I have a copy, and I really hope to meet Alice Cooper one day and be like, here, here's your grandfather's history. He was kind of pushed aside. So, you know, here, this is kind of like a fun thing for your history. I don't know if, I, I don't know if Alice Cooper has it or not, but if I ever meet him, I'd love to give it to him just to say, hey, your father was a trail, or your grandfather was a trailblazer too. And <laughs> people didn't really agree with him on certain things. So we'll see. Yeah, thanks for your comments and questions. Any others? Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs>